All right, so let's start talking about the poster. So this whole file that you can see here, let's move my picture. The whole file is available in the, the group project. So as soon as you open up the group project link or the group project folder on Blackboard, um, this PowerPoint presentation, there's like two or three slides, uh, is a file in there now. Usually when I add new files, they go to the bottom. So if you're having trouble finding it, it's probably because the file is at the bottom of the stack, so to speak, in, the, in that file or in that folder. Um, this whole file is called Rosenthal Group Projects PowerPoint or GP PowerPoint. So everything you see here is available on Blackboard. I'm just gonna kind of go through these couple slides here. Um, I'm gonna show you here in a second a poster. Um, actually, I have three posters that I posted on Blackboard. They're all posters that I have presented at professional uh, scientific conferences back in the day. And I'm, I've given you the exact posters that I used. Um, and basically what I'm going to suggest is that you, er is you erase the words that I put in and you erase the pictures and you just replace it with your own. Um, and when you do that, let me fix this one little thing here. Uh, when you do that, there we go. Um, when you do that, I'm going to want these four sections in your final poster. And I've explained kind of what type of information I want to see in each of these sections. Um, introduction section, uh, like explain the importance of your study. You've kind of already done that in your proposal. Uh, but here, if you want to kind of include some scientific theories that you know about that you think are relevant, that could that could help. I'm not going to, um, and it says if applicable, include scientific theories or previous published findings. If you can't include stuff like that, I won't count off. But um, in an actual poster, you would include like previous studies. You talk about important previous studies or you talk about important existing theories. If there is something like that that you know about that could help you when you're kind of justifying why you thought you're your project was important, why you think the question that was asked in your uh, project is important, that could help. Um, the method, this is a, a section where you're gonna have to be a little creative. I do want you to state the number of participants you had in your study. Some of the groups eliminated participants because some of the participants gave responses that were not quantifiable, um, but that was a small subset of the group. If you were one of those groups, then, um, You'll want to state how you, which participants you excluded and why you excluded them and how many you were left with, how many final participants you analyzed the data for. Uh, but yeah, you didn't actually collect the data. So in the methods, I basically want you to kind of make up an explanation. Try and, try and think about how would these type of data be collected. We had data from like, what, 290 or something participants or something like that. Um, you were the participants. Um, and you and other classes. So kind of make up something or you can kind of try and guess exactly, um, you know, how I haven't given you the specific information, but you do know that you are the participants and you and the other statistics class classes were the participants. Uh, so basically kind of make up a story to explain how the data were collected. Um, and make sure that you explain, by the time your intro and method sections are done, we should make sure that we know, we should have an idea of what variables you are using in your study. Um, but in your results, you'll kind of state explicitly again what your variables are, state what the variables are and what analysis you conducted. If you're doing correlational studies, I've mentioned this, almost all groups that have did, gave me proposals that were correlational, you need to include your R value, P value, and a scatter plot. If you're doing a mean comparison, that is a t-test or a one-way ANOVA, uh, you need to include your T value or your F value. It's T if it's a T test, F if it's ANOVA. We haven't gotten to ANOVA in class yet. I don't think anyone's doing ANOVA for the project. You'd also have to include your degrees of freedom, um, state what the condition means are that you're comparing, and the standard deviation for each condition. All this stuff is usually given in SPSS. If you need help finding any of this stuff, definitely contact me 
uh, and I can help you find it on your SPSS output or help you run the SPSS analysis on KU's virtual lab version of SPSS. Uh, I don't think any groups have three or more conditions, but if you do have three or more conditions, I do want a graph. If you just have two conditions, you can just say, this is the mean for condition one and the standard deviation. Here's the mean of condition two and the standard deviation. But if you have three or more conditions, it's easier for the, the reader if you have a graph where you can see the means as the height of the bar graphs instead of just seeing the numbers themselves. Um, otherwise, graphs are optional. So if you have a t-test with only two conditions, you don't, you're not required to have a graph. That's APA rules. Uh, but if you want to make a graph, that's fine, and I can help you with that as well. There's also some instructions in some of the group project folders how to make graphs in Excel. Um, and I actually really, really like making graphs in Excel. And I've done it many times, and I'm pretty good at it, and I would be glad to help students make graphs in Excel if you need more help. I've made lots of graphs that were published in journals, uh, and it's fun, frankly. Um, discussion. Um, summarize results, determine, state whether your hypothesis was correct or not. If there are any limitations of the study, um, make sure you mention them here. Um, and so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the templates. So it says Rosenthal's templates in the folder, constructing, presenting, and evaluating posters. I have one poster that I'm going to go through. Let's see, where is it? Right here? Yes. So let's make this one big. Okay, so here is uh, a poster. I, I want to make sure my internet's okay. I got a weird little message just then. You should be all right. All right. Uh, so here's a poster I presented several years ago um, at a conference. And I have five sections on this poster. Um, I think what you'll probably do, well, you notice each of these little, oops, what's going on here? Each of these little sections right here, like the introduction, this little section right here, the stimulating methods, is basically a text box in PowerPoint. And you can um, change the size of the text box. Like I can't, I'm in presentation mode right now, so I can't click on it. But you can click on the text box and then you can grab the corner and you can shrink it down to make it smaller or you can drag it out this way to make it bigger. You can click on a text box and just press delete and it will go away, completely erase it. Each one of these boxes, as you see, is basically a text box. This poster is presented on Blackboard and there's blank templates as well. But what I suggest is that you just take this poster and you erase everything except for the text boxes and like the, the heading boxes. And you just make it you just make it your own by filling in the detail. So instead of saying listeners form expectations for future pitches while listening to music, you'll say something which is related to your project in the introduction. You probably you're only gonna have four sections. So you're this section right here where it says additional questions addressed by the current study, probably just erase that box. And then basically all you'd be left open left with was introduction, methods, results, and conclusions. The result sections, if you have a graph, that would be where you present the graph. Um, a couple things which my suggestions are um, uh, for a poster is that to never write in paragraph form if possible and to use bullet points as much as possible instead of long paragraphs which um, have lots and lots of text. Um, basically, the goal of a, of a poster is to minimize the amount of text that you actually have to write down. So um, the, one of the best ways to do that, and you can see I, I did a pretty good job. This poster is old, um, like four or five years ago. This study was published in 2014, and so I presented the, this around 2015, probably 2014 or 15. So it's several years old. Uh, but you notice how instead of writing in paragraphs, I just wrote in bullet points. There's a bullet point right there. Here's another bullet point. Here's a bullet point. And I kind of supplemented sometimes the bullet points with little pictures of the brain because this is a neuroscience study that I did back in the day. Um, if you can use pictures, that's great. Pic generally, if you can say something with a picture instead of words in a poster, that's better. And the reason why that's okay is because in real life, when you're giving a poster, we have the quarantine, so we're not going to be doing this exactly. In real life, when we're doing a poster, you would be 
pointing at the poster while you're talking about it. And you could point to the picture and be like, in this picture, here's what's going on. And so you don't have to write down exactly what's going on in the poster. Instead, you can use the picture. And then when you're giving the presentation, you just, you just point to the picture and explain what the picture is about instead of writing down every single detail about the picture. So writing bullet points, and if you can, supplementing it with pictures. Pictures are not required, but it helps. The less text you can have, generally the better. So bullet points, supplementing with pictures is a great approach. You'll be erasing this box down here probably because it's not one of the essential sections. I just had extra space that I had to fill up. And so I decided to have that section right there. Stimuli and methods. Once again, you want to make sure that you say things like you want to make sure that I know how many participants you used. If you eliminated participants, tell me that. Um, make up some story about how the data were collected or you can try and tell as much as you know about how the data were actually collected, how they were given to um, statistics students in various classes in spring 2020, stuff like that. Write it in bullet points, once again. Um, and you're not probably going to have as long of a method section as this. This is a kind of kind of complicated study that had stimuli and um, a lot of stuff were going on as far as like what participants were doing in the experiment. Um, the goal, though, is to spread out the text as much as possible. So use space. You're not going to have tons and tons of words to write. Feel free to space them out. So I, this is kind of densely, you know, everything's kind of dense in mind compared to what you'll probably do. If you have to space your words out, your, your bullet points out a little bit more, that's okay. If you want to increase the font, that's a little bit of a trick. Um, the goal is to fill out the entire box with you know, information, but not to cram information in there. Space it out, allow it to breathe. Um, same with the results section. Your, this, my results section is kind of complicated. I had three independent variables in my study. And all three independent variables are shown in this. You guys, I, don't, I think the most amount of independent variables anyone has in the studies for this class is one. So you're not going to have really complicated graphs like these. You're not going to have tons of results. Um, just report the essential results that will basically be either your correlation or your t-test. If anyone's doing an ANOVA, which I don't think anyone does, you'll report the ANOVA, you'll report your means, your standard deviation, the essential information that I told you to include in that section. My font is small because I had to fill in a lot of space. Make the font bigger. Center it in the middle. Space it out nicely. Just try and fill out as much space. If you have a figure, if you have a graph that you want to make, that helps take up some space. Uh, it can help you make that put it somewhere in the results section, try and make it kind of uh, pleasing to the eye, space things out um, nicely, kind of like they are here. Uh, and then conclusions, you'll just have several bullet points, one or two bullet points probably for you guys um, that um, kind of, you know, addresses the things that I mentioned in my slide that I showed you earlier. Um, so the thing that out of all of these sections, the part that I'll be grading the most strictly will be the results because this is a method, this is a stats class. And so the results are the thing, obviously, that we've talked about the most. I'll make sure that your um, the, the you correctly reported your T values, degrees of freedom values, P values, that your means are present, that your standard deviations are present, and that everything that you have provided is consistent. Um, like if the means you show are the exact same number, but you say there's a significant difference, then there's something wrong there. So I'll make sure that the story you're telling makes sense, that everything is, there's no holes in the plot, so to speak. Um, so the, yeah, the results will be what I'm grading most strictly. Otherwise, I'm mostly kind of be great grading on just, does the, does the group project make sense? Um, do, are the essential parts of the project present? Are they here? Is the project completed as, as requested? So I'm not going to be grading anything strictly, really, except for the results section. Otherwise, it's kind of like a completion grade, an effort grade. Um, let's see if we think there's anything else to talk about. Uh, yeah. So this part, I, I'm, I'm working with uh, Dr. Marshall right now. We will be having a, a Blackboard discussion a forum type of thing. So you guys um, are going to be, you're going to be posting your poster along with a script. You have a one to two minute like walkthrough or speech basically. If you are giving the speech, the one to two minute walkthrough would be like, you're gonna write out the text of what you would have been saying 
if you are giving an actual speech for this. You're not going to be giving an actual speech for this. Um, you're just going to be writing out like your presentation, writing out your speech as though you were, and that's going to be presented. So your, your poster will be posted to the Blackboard discussion, along with your one to two minute written out walkthrough, which is basically would be what you are saying if you are giving the actual poster presentation. I do want to highlight that I ask here to include one nonverbal behavior that you would demonstrate during your, your presentation. So you're just going to be writing out the words of what you would have been saying, but it's nice to be cognizant to some extent of some of the nonverbal behaviors that you would be demonstrating. Like when you're talking about a figure, you'll say, while I'm saying the following sentence, I would point at the figure. And I have an example here. Uh, uh, the results did not support our hypothesis while I'm pointing at the, um, and then say, while pointing at the scatter plot, we did not find a significant correlation. And I'm moving my hand like horizontally across the scatter plot because you know, if you have a um, no correlation, the dots are basically random, which basically will end up looking like a flat line, like it's dead. Um, and so those are, that's my nonverbal. I actually had kind of like non, two nonverbal behaviors. I do want, I may will expect at least one nonverbal behavior in the text that you write about uh, for the walkthrough. Uh, the last couple things for the group project is there will be some peer evaluation forms. So part of the, this, all of this will be available. I'm going to have you guys, I'll give more information about exactly when I want these due, but the, the Blackboard discussion forum will start Monday, May 11th. That's the Monday of finals week, and it will last until probably Friday of that week. So you'll have all week. Um, and what I need to, what you're going to do is you're going to have to evaluate four other posters. And there's an evaluation form which is in uh, the group projects folder on Blackboard. If you need help finding it, I can help you find it, but it's in the group projects folder. Valuation forms, uh, uh, this, and I think it's in, it might, yeah. Um, I guess it's in a folder called evaluation forms. Uh, but there's the peer evaluations where you will be talking about other group projects and evaluating the quality of their posters and the quality of their one to two minute walkthrough. Uh, and also, there'll be team member evaluations where you will talk about your other teammates that you worked with and you will rate their contributions uh, to this project. Uh, and then that's it. That's, that's basically everything for the group project. You've already done most of the hard work. Most of you have already done your analyses. Um, really, all you're going to have to do is kind of take my poster and fill it in with the information uh, from your proposals. So that's it. Anyone have questions or comments about this? Um, can you remind us how this like final poster is weighted compared to all of our other grades? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, it says in the syllabus, and what I, I think it's kind—I of, think if I recall, it's like twenty percent, um, which is good because usually I talk to Susan Marshall and I know what my plan is. Usually the grades for these are pretty good. Really, all you have to do is follow the instructions. Um, I, I believe it's 20%. Um, like the whole group project, everything is 20%. That's what I believe it is. I don't remember off the top of my head. It says in the syllabus. Anything else? All right. Uh, so we have a little bit on confidence intervals. Okay, so we've been working on independent samples t-test. Uh, and here is an entire independent samples t-test that we did by, that I did by hand last time or that I did with, you know, formulas here. Um, pooled variance, estimated standard error. Here's our t-formula. Remembering that an independent samples t-test is used when you have a, a between subjects design, that is when you have, um, where participants contribute data to only one condition, that's between subjects design. Um, so we have in independent samples t-test, you have two sample means, M1 and M2, and your, the, the t-test is performed to determine whether these two means differ from each other. I also, I showed you last time how to do this in SPSS. Um, and when we did it in SPSS, we got the exact same numbers that we did 
We did them by hand here. And then we ran the exact same data set in SPSS and we got the exact same numbers right here. So it's good, SPSS verified what we did by hand. Uh, now, teaching you about, we're gonna talk about confidence intervals, which we've done these a lot now. We did some of these in chapter eight for Z. Um, we did these in chapter nine for the one sample T test. Uh, and now we're gonna do a couple confidence intervals for the independent measure, independent samples T test now. Last time we talked about the null hypothesis um, was it mu one minus mu two equals zero. That is if there's no difference between our two conditions, when you subtract the mean of one condition from the mean of the other, you should get close to zero. So this is our null hypothesis. If there's no differences between the two means and when you subtract them from each other, that number should be close to zero. What we're gonna do with the null hypothesis is determine whether, or with our confidence interval, we're gonna determine whether zero is inside or outside of our confidence interval. If zero is outside of our confidence interval, then we reject the null hypothesis. If zero is inside of our confidence interval, then we accept the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Um, okay, uh, so previous, um, I wanna remind you that previous confidence intervals, when we've made them, they've been centered around a sample mean, M. It's always been centered around a sample mean, M. With independent measures t-test, it's a tiny bit more complicated. Now the confidence interval is centered around the difference between mean one and mean two. So the confidence interval, it's not just a single sample mean, it's the difference between mean one and mean two. Remember, we expect that if there's no difference between the means that if the null hypothesis is true, the difference will be zero. And then, but then we measure the actual difference between M1 and M2 to determine whether it's actually zero or whether it's bigger than zero. Uh, so here's our formula for the confidence interval, the same exact kind of structure. Like you should be detecting a pattern now. All these confidence intervals are basically the same. You have a critical value that you put first, then you multiply it times this thing, which is the estimated standard error, plus the sample mean. Now this time, the thing that we're adding is the sample mean difference. So it's two numbers subtracted from each other in parentheses instead of just a single sample mean, which is what we were dealing with pre previously. Now it's a, in parentheses, the difference between two sample means. So below these general formulas, I've actually plugged in the numbers from the t-test example that we've been dealing with. So we calculated this t-test by hand. We then did it in SPSS. Now we're doing the confidence interval. So we've been doing a whole bunch of stuff with this one example. We already looked up the critical t's last time. This critical T was, the sample size was 20. So if, by the way, if, if we're doing an independent samples T test and our sample size is 20, does anyone remember what the degrees of freedom is? Can someone tell me if the sample size is 20 and we're doing an independent samples T test, what would the degrees of freedom be? Eighteen. 18 is correct, thank you. It's the sample size minus two for an independent samples T test. And so degrees of freedom, 18, two-tailed test, alpha equals 0.05. There's our three pieces of information. We look at our T table at that point at the, for the critical T for degrees of freedom equals 18, two-tailed test, alpha equals 0.05. We look that up and we see that the critical T is 2.101. Uh, it's a two-tailed test, so we have a negative 2.101 and we have a positive 2.101. That's what these, these two parts of the confidence interval, this is the, the left side, the negative side, and this is the right side, the positive side. Take that critical T that we got from the T table, multiply it times the estimated standard error, plus negative one. We get negative one because the sample means are six minus seven, um, and um, you, so you take negative one, here's the difference right here, and then you take the difference, um, negative one, plus this stuff over here, which is a negative number as well. And the thing you get on this side, negative 1.7003. Do the same thing down here, um, except you know, this, this number is positive. And then you get negative 0.29967. This is our confidence interval. Uh, that negative is small. 
Um, but these are both negative numbers. I know that negative is small, so make sure you don't miss that negative right there. Um, and then you ask the question once again, is zero in our confidence interval? Zero is not in this confidence interval. And so we make the same exact decision that we made for previous hypothesis tests using this exact data set. You always get the same decision to reject or accept the null hypothesis. And here, because our p-value was less than 0.05, we rejected the null hypothesis. Here, because our t-value, negative three, was more in the tail than our critical t-value of negative 2.101, it was in the rejection region, we rejected the null hypothesis. For the confidence interval, zero is not in our confidence interval. Therefore, we still reject the null hypothesis. All these different things, the hand calculation of T, calculating the T-test in SPSS, doing the confidence interval right here, they're all basically ways of, of calculating the exact same decision, whether to accept or reject the null hypothesis. And they're all mathematically equivalent, whether you're doing the hypothesis test with T or whether you're doing the confidence interval, you'll always get the same decision, whether to accept or reject the null hypothesis. Uh, so here's another example of a confidence interval. Um, so let's see, this is, um, yeah, so this is the influence of watching a television show. Hello, you cut out. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Cool. How much did it, how much did you, how long was I cutting out before it finally died? Did you miss a bunch of stuff that I said? For instance, did you get all the stuff about this confidence interval right here? Is there something I need to repeat about this confidence interval right here? I think we've got most of it. Thank you. Uh, okay, so this confidence interval, and this is the last thing we're gonna do for this class, for this uh, today's class. Um, another example of confidence interval for independent pit samples t-test. So here we have um, people that, kids that watched Sesame Street when they were kids. And then we have another group that did not watch Sesame Street when they're kids. And then they grow up and they take some type of test in school. Um, and the sample mean M, for the people that watched Sesame Street when they were kids, their sample mean on some school test was 93, there's 10 kids. Um, and then a different group of kids that did not watch Sesame Street when they were kids, their mean on some test was 85. Um, and their sample mean, or their sample size was also 10. So the total sample size is 20. Therefore, once again, our degrees of freedom would be 18. Our degrees of freedom is 18 because the total sample size is 20. 10 plus 10 is 20. 20 minus two is 18. Equivalently, you can do the degrees of freedom for each group separately. 10 minus one is nine, 10 minus one is nine, nine plus nine also equals 18. The degrees of freedom. Estimated standard error is two. I'm just giving you that. You're not having to calculate it. And it was giving you the estimated standard error is a nice round number two. Um, and then we have a confidence interval. Once again, critical T, negative critical T um, times estimated standard error. Um, plus the difference between your two means, M1 minus M2 in parentheses. Uh, plug in your numbers. So our critical T hasn't changed. It's still negative 2.101. Um, if you want to verify, you'd go to your T table. Degrees of freedom equals 18. Two tails. Alpha equals 0.05. Look up the number, and you're going to see it's 2.101. We have the negative side. We have the positive side, which you can see the negative is the top, the positive is the bottom. You multiply it by two, the two is right there. That's the estimated standard error. Multiply that by two. And then you add the mean difference, 93 minus 85. 93, 85, down here. And you get 3.798 for the lower bound. And then for the upper bound, when you do the math, you would get 12.202. And then this is nice, a uh, little demonstration, like a nice way of visualizing the confidence interval. The confidence interval right here and then you ask the question once again is zero in the confidence interval if the answer is no you reject the null hypothesis and it really 
it really helps, I think, this picture because you can see this whole thing represents basically the sample mean right here. This represents the sample mean. Remember, we said when we're doing confidence interval, the thing which is in the, uh, the confidence interval is basically the sample mean. When we're doing a hypothesis test, the thing which is in the middle of the distribution is the population mean. When we're doing a confidence interval, the thing which is in the center of the distribution is the sample mean. In this case, it's M1 minus M2. It's the difference between two sample means. And this basically represents the difference between the sample means. This represents the entire sample mean difference right here. And the question we're asking is, is the, is the population, the, no, the population mean, which in this case is assumed to be zero, the population mean difference, mu1 minus mu2, look at the null hypothesis, it assumes that that equals zero. If zero is outside of this confidence interval, then that means that the sample mean is separate from the, the population mean, that that means that these two parts are separate, is, which is why you conclude that there's a significant difference. If zero is inside the confidence interval, then you basically can see they're not separate, in which case you would accept the null hypothesis. So that's all I have to talk about today. I am happy to stay to answer people's questions about the group project, or I am happy to talk about independent samples t-tests or any other things that you people want to talk about.